Well, welcome, friends. I have started the recording, and I will record the lecture portion of this afternoon only, and we'll post that on the St. John's Episcopal Church Boulder, Colorado YouTube channel. Um, so if you have friends uh, who were unable to attend today, uh, you can watch at least that part. It is not our practice to post uh, the Q&A. I think that's something that you all have the right to, to engage in without being on the internet for posterity. I'd like to begin us with a short prayer and then I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit into our midst and fill our ears with what you would have us hear. Fill our lips with what you would have us speak and fill our hearts with what you would have us do with what we learn here today. Thank you for the gift of our speaker, Joshua, for the time he has made to share his expertise with us. And thank you for the gift of each person present. Amen. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Joshua Carell. He is a social psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at CU Boulder. He earned his PhD at CU in 2005. And that same year, uh, he became an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. In 2012, he came back to Colorado to join the faculty of CU Boulder. And he is known for studying the psychology of racial bias, especially as it pertains to police shootings. Joshua grew up in Colorado, um, and he has a real Boulder connection and kind of a, a secondhand um, St. John's connection, actually. Um, his grandmother, Ruth, was the first female mayor of Boulder uh, on about 1980. And Ruth and Penfield Tate, uh, who was a member of our congregation back in the day, they served on the Boulder City Council together. Um, and today, as we were uh, just joining the call early, I, I told Joshua that he might hear a puppy in the background. Um, and he said, it's okay, you might hear my one-year-old and my three-year-old in the background. <laughs> So it is my delight um, to just about turn the turn the the presentation over to Joshua. Um, I, I do want to say that the the goal of today is for us to listen with an ear toward, okay, knowing what we're about to learn, what do people of faith do with this knowledge, right? How are we being prompted to act to change ourselves, change our community, change the structures of the society in which we live? How are we being called to act with what we learn? So Joshua, I will mute um, and give this to you. And thank you for being with us. Um, before I get started, is this working? Can you see this okay? Um, well, um, you are very welcome. Um, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk about, <laughs> I'm going to talk about like 20 years of research. Um, and, um, I don't need to, I've talked about this time and again, so um, I don't have any particular need to get through this um, presentation, but I can go um, kind of indefinitely, um, and, or we can stop at any point. Um, I would also like to ask, um, to the extent that you're comfortable, if you, um, if you have a question or want me to stop uh, and um, 
talk about something that I just said or that I'm, uh, uh, feel free to feel free to interrupt me. Um, uh, Susan said I was at the University of Chicago and they are big into interruptions. So um, interrupt away. I love it. It makes it feel a lot more dynamic. And um, as somebody before the before we got started was saying it's kind of weird when everybody's on mute because um, you know, um, it doesn't feel like a conversation. So I'm happy to make this into a conversation and stop at any point and kind of go off on tangents. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, police and racial bias. Um, this is actually an adapted version of a talk that I have given in the past, um, but it's adapted for you. Um, and I'm going to, again, talk about um, a lot of research. For, for us, this research really began with this guy. Um, this is Amadou Diallo. Um, and in 1999, uh, he was shot and killed by four plainclothes officers uh, who thought he looked suspicious because he was sitting on the stoop of his apartment building in the Bronx. Um, he was unarmed um, and they eviscerated him. I, they fired 41 rounds, they hit him 19 times. They, um, they killed him and really, I mean, he had been doing nothing even remotely problematic except sitting on his, the stoop of his apartment building. And, and when they approached him, he got scared and ran. Um, so that, that was, an, that was, don't do that. Um, if police approach you. Um, but that was the extent of his, um, he was not a bad guy. This is not a bad guy. Um, uh, and he, his death, uh, I don't know how many of you remember this, but his death prompted all kinds of outrage across the country. Um, it was a big deal. Um, and that's what started us on this research. Um, but since then, we've seen wave after wave of death, outrage, and then kind of fatigue, um, forgetting. Um, here's Michael Brown. I, uh, there are 20 people I could put up here. Um, um, so, you know, several from the last year. Um, um, and, you know, we've watched this play out again and again and again. Um, and in retrospect, you know, we, we learn, we learn about these, these folks, we learn about them after they after they've died. Um, and we know that we know that they're good guys. Um, this kind of thing is happening fairly uh, regularly. This is um, very incomplete data, but this is crowdsourced data um, from a uh, study that was published in 2015, a really kind of remarkable study that looked um, nationwide at the United States. Um, and try to predict the likelihood of black versus white suspects being shot by police. And again, incomplete data, you'll see that most of the country here is white. That means they don't have, don't have any data from those um, counties, but um, they have data from a lot of counties. And what you can see across that, um, across the country um, is a pattern that, that suggests uh, that um, police officers are much more likely to shoot an unarmed black target suspect relative to an unarmed white target. So um, just for by way of reference here, um, a score of one on this on this chart means parity. Um, and none of these scores are one. None of them. Um, all of the data here are are, are showing a, a bias in the in the direction of different like preferential shoot de decisions to shoot when the target is black when the suspect is black. Um, and, you know, this paints a, a pretty uncomfortable picture for most of us. Um, and a, again, it's easy to look back on the decisions that the police make and say, um, what is going on here? What's the, where's the problem? And, um, as we began to try to study this, we took a slightly different perspective, which is, um, to think about what the police themselves are going through in these decision-making processes. So um, instead of pictures like this, we're, we're, we're considering a picture like this, where you have to decide whether this person, you don't know a lot about this person, um, whether this person poses a threat to you or not. Um, this is the police officer's situation. Um, they know that they think that there may be a problem and they have very little um, information. How to decide? 
Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about our work looking at what we call the police officer's dilemma. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to talk about our efforts to measure um, bias in the laboratory, um, our efforts to test police officers themselves, um, the question of training. And this is going to be a different kind of training than you may be thinking, but I'm going to talk a little bit about training um, and the good side of it, and then I'm going to talk about the bad side of it. Um, and again, stop me at any point. So um, if you want to, if you want to talk about anything that I'm saying, I'm going to begin with the question of bias in the laboratory. So this is the first. I'm going to present you the first data we ever collected on this on this topic back, you know, 20 years ago. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the basic phenomenon of, that that we've been studying, and then we're going to talk about some proposed psychological mechanisms. Um, the basic phenomenon again is to, we take the officer's perspective and we say. Let's consider an, an ambiguous situation um, where you don't know if the person is a threat or not, and you have to make a decision quickly. Um, and the decisions that we're going to offer to our participants are a decision to shoot. Um, if you think the person is a bad guy, you shoot. Um, if you think the person is not a bad guy, is a good guy, then you press a different button to say don't shoot. Um, it is not by any stretch of the imagination, a perfect encapsulation of what police officers go through, but it's a way for us to kind of simplify the phenomenon and bring it into the laboratory to study it. Um, the question that we really have is whether in that, in that ambiguous situation, in, when there's pressure, do people rely on secondary kinds of information? So rather than dis discussing whether or not the person is actually a threat, um, do they rely on cues like race or gender or even the neighborhood um, that, that the uh, encounter is taking place in to inform the decision because they don't have perfect information. Um, we set this up as a very, very bad video game. Um, I am not a computer programmer. So this is like a slideshow where we have white or black uh, male targets pop up on the screen. Um, each one is either holding a gun or like something harmless, a wallet, a cell phone, uh, a can of Coke. Um, and the player's task is simply to shoot the, the bad guys by pressing the shoot button, like I said, or press don't shoot for the good guys. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, a variety of backgrounds pop up um, on the screen, and then a person appears in one of them. And you have to make a decision. And maybe you're too slow. We give you, you can't be too slow. You have, there's time pressure. You, um, we want people to respond quickly. So if you make a mistake, like you respond too, too slowly, um, you lose points. Um, the next trial begins, background, 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 backgrounds. When's somebody going to pop up? There, somebody pops up. So people are confused. They don't know when they're going to see the targets. Here we see uh, in old Union Station, um, a black man holding a nine millimeter pistol. Um, I press the shoot button. I get points for making the right decision because he had a gun. He was a bad guy. Um, background, another person pops up. And so you get the idea. Um, we can, we put people through like a hundred trials of this task uh, to look at their uh, decisions and then we can analyze their decisions. We can see how quickly they make uh, a decision when they do the right thing. Like if, if the guy has a gun and they shoot him, how quickly do they shoot? If the person has a, a cell phone, how quickly do they say don't shoot on average? And what we typically see is something like this. Um, this is a pattern that you should just get used to seeing. Um, I'm going to show it to you again and again and again. Um, for a, an armed target, uh, participants are a few milliseconds, like 10-ish milliseconds faster to shoot if the target is black um, rather than white. Uh, if the target is unarmed, and the correct decision here is to say don't shoot, they're about 10 milliseconds faster to uh, say don't shoot um, if the target is white rather than black. Um, so we can look at bias in what I'm going to call latencies or reaction time. Um, we can also look at bias in the mistakes that people make. So here, the question is, when people screw up, how do they screw up? Is it random? Um, no, it is not random. Um, first of all, we see that people are generally pretty good at this task. So like, um, I'm, I'm showing you error percentages, and these percentages go from, you know, eight to 16%, most of the time people are making the right decision, but they do, they do make mistakes over the course of 100 trials. Um, and when they make mistakes, 
um, they make a biased pattern of mistakes. So again, let's consider the armed target. Correct decision is to say, shoot. Um, when do people screw up? Well, people rarely screw up if the target is black and armed. Um, most often, if the target is black and armed, they shoot him. Um, if the target is white and armed, however, they make mistakes more frequently. So they're, uh, they're more likely to say don't shoot to a, a, a white target who has a gun. Um, now let's consider the unarmed targets. So this is the case of, you know, Amadou Diallo, um, Michael Brown, so on. Um, and again, we see uh, most of the time people are making the right decision, but they do, they do slip up. Um, about 12% of the time when an unarmed target is, is white, he gets shot. Um, when, uh, if a, but if a, a target, uh, an unarmed target is black, he's shot about 16, 17% of the time. Um, this is a very um, robust pattern. We see this again and again and again. I'm going to present one kind of different way of looking at these data, um, just because in most of the future research that we deal with, this is how we present it. Um, and again, I want you to stop me if this isn't making sense. Um, this is uh, a perspective, um, an analytical perspective called signal detection theory. And you don't need to get into the details of it, but basically what we can do is look at decisions that people make in this task to, to understand how well they're able to dis disentangle armed from unarmed targets <clears throat> in the course of the task. And we can do that separately for the white targets and the black targets. So here are um, data from white targets. And what we can see is that participants are relatively good at, at separating the unarmed targets from the armed targets. Um, but the really cool thing about this uh, approach to analysis is that it allows us to identify a point at which participants decide a target is threatening enough that that, that warrants deciding to shoot. So right, some of the unarmed targets may be holding a cell phone in a very innocuous manner, right? Others may be holding it in a way that maybe looks more like a gun, looks more threatening. So for those unarmed targets, even though they're unarmed, they may look more threatening. And that may lead to what we'll call a false alarm, a decision to shoot an unarmed target. And again, that doesn't happen all that frequently for white targets. Let's go ahead and put up the um, data for the black targets. So again, here we can separate out like how well people, we can see how well people are able to distinguish armed and unarmed targets. And we can say like, oh, again, they're doing pretty well. Most of the time they're not getting confused. They can, they can say, oh yeah, the black target has a, is unarmed. This black target is armed. They're, they're separating those two distributions. Um, but again, we can ask at what point do they decide that the target is threatening enough to shoot? And what we can see is that, that these participants typically set a lower bar to decide that a black target is threatening enough that I should shoot. So what that means is that they are making more false alarms for the black targets. So this gray region under the curve represents the unarmed black targets who get shot by mistake. Um, and that, that gray region for the black targets is um, substantially bigger than the gray region for the white targets. Um, I'm gonna use this lens um, a couple of times as we go through the, the talk. And, and the important point to remember, this is really all that you need to remember is, we can measure how good people are at the task, how good they are at, at separating armed from unarmed targets, and we can measure their, how trigger happy they are. And the way we measure how trigger happy they are is we look at how low this line is. So if I set a line way down here to decide about shooting black targets, then I'm gonna be shooting a lot of black targets. Um, I'm all the time, even if they're unarmed, I'm gonna be shooting, I'm gonna be shooting them. Um, Joshua, Joshua? Yes. I have a question for you. Is all of your data um, for black targets, is it blacks only or is it uh, Hispanics or other people of color? included in that data? Most of the data, I think really everything that I'm going to talk with you about today is black targets, but we've done the same study with Latinx um, targets. Um, and we've done it with Asian targets. We've got like, yeah, multi-ethnic versions of this task. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in the, in the primary course of this, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, you won't probably be surprised to um, discover that the pattern for um, um, uh, Latino male targets is is rel is fairly similar to the pattern for black targets. Are the a, a follow up on that as well? I, 
do you have data on black shooters? Uh, you know, there aren't that many black police officers, but does the data change when the police officer is black? No. No. Oh, interesting. Huh. I know. Yeah. yeah um, I, I've actually, heard that from some black officers that, you know, one who even made the comment, well, I live on the street and this is what it's like. But I've wondered whether or not that was simply bias that they inherited from their force. Well, let's talk about that. Um, I can't see actually um, the, the name of who's, who's talking. Oh, Mike, Michael, was that you? Yes, that was uh, Mike Simpson. Okay, let's, let's make, um, make sure to bring me back to that when we get to the end of this, because um, it's a really interesting point. Um, it's a really interesting point. So yeah, black participants uh, from CU and, and black um, officers don't differ um, in any particularly meaningful way from white ones. And it, 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 re it really raises a, a question about where, where we would need to intervene um, if we want to do anything here. Um, so uh, it's, a really, it's a really important question, especially for the end thing, but I was not actually planning to talk about it. So if you make sure to bring me back to that um, when I get to my conclusion slide, I would really appreciate it. Um, and if I don't get to my conclusion slide, bring me back to it anyway. Like it's, it's a really important point, I think. Um, um, other questions about this before I move on? It is kind of important that this sinks in because <laughs> if not, then the rest of the talk is gonna be gobbledygook. So. Okay, I'm gonna move ahead. Maybe. Okay, so um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I want to I want to set up um, a kind of a, a, one of the studies that I'm going to talk about later. I'm going to talk about psychological mechanisms. The psychological mechanisms that we really think are at play here are um, stereotypes about threat and danger. Um, when we think about stereotypes, most people think about stereotypes that we hold, like you know, in in the nugget, the bias nugget in our head, um, and I want to dispel that a little bit even at the outset, but we'll, again, we'll come back to it. Um, stereotypes exist all around us. Um, we are peppered with um, the idea that black um, and danger go together in all kinds of ways. Um, and our brains pick that information up, no surprise. Um, so, uh, but the idea here is wherever these stereotypes come from, if I see a black target and that I identify him as black, um, and that's associated with whatever stereotypes are, um, are kind of active, salient, or available in my, in my mind. Um, I will kind of use that as a filter. And in the context of this decision, right, the decision where, where I'm looking for potential threats, only one of these pieces of information is even remotely relevant, dangerous. Um, but that is incredibly relevant. And so that may pro, pro um, prompt me to um, activate a kind of behavior pattern where I respond um, as if there is a threat, whether or not he's threatening or not, right? So he's got a cell phone, not particularly threatening. Um, by contrast, a, a white target, um, again, maybe I see this uh, guy pop up and I identify him as white, and that maybe comes, like, generates other stereotypic content, none of which is particularly relevant to the um, current situation. So, oh, so, so that's kind of the end of the process. There's, there's it, it's not relevant. Um, the information that I generate about this guy is just kind of, very, yeah. Um, so, um, okay. So we've looked at this in a variety of different ways. I'm just gonna describe one. Um, and this is a study where we had people read, before they, before they began the, the video game, we had them read a newspaper article describing a, a series of really actually quite brutal um, violent crimes, um, disturbing violent crimes. Um, and they were either uh, attributed to uh, a black suspect or to a white suspect. So all we're doing is kind of infusing their, their minds with a, a really salient association between black people and threat, or for a different group of participants, between white people and threat. How'd they do on the game? Um, so we just have them do the game. And again, we're going to look at their, at their performance um, through that lens of signal detection. And I'm just going to put up the chart here and, and just remind everyone, like, the, the question here is how low is the bar to decide to shoot? So scores that are around zero are, are fair. Those are scores that are not biased in one way or the other. Scores that are way below zero, 
are scores where there is a trigger happy bias. So low, low bars mean trigger happy. High bars, bars that are above zero mean conservative. Like I'm, I'm gonna avoid shooting it at all, if at all possible. Um, so what we can see is that when we have people read about a white criminal, they set a pretty low bar for everyone. Um, the black targets do not benefit from having read about a black, a white criminal, but, um, but these people are now actually um, likely to shoot, well, they're likely to shoot everybody. They shoot all the, they shoot, they're likely to shoot the black targets, but they're also likely to shoot the white targets. So um, in this kind of perverse way, we have, by having them read about a white criminal, we have, we have gotten rid of bias. Um, now they're just shooting everybody. Um, it's not difference, different according to race. But when they read about the black criminal, um, what we see is a very, very lenient, very trigger happy response for um, black targets and a relatively conservative response for white targets. Um, so this is evidence that we can, by, by kind of making stereotypes more or less salient in somebody's mind, we can change their performance on the game. This is, this is not particularly surprising. This is very consistent with the way we think race influences behavior um, from a social cognitive perspective. Um, okay, so that's the basic mechanism. That's the basic story. Um, we have also, in a variety of, of studies, gone on to test police officers. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. this the the um, crux of it is, is fairly straightforward. Well, relatively straightforward. Um, I'm going to talk about two tests that we did back in 2007. Um, the first test is a relatively easy test. This is with um, officers from Denver, um, four different, uh, four different um, uh, substations within Denver, um, and 127 civilians um, drawn from the DMVs in those same, sub, in those same uh, locations. Um, we also got 113 officers that I'm going to call national officers. These are, uh, they were at a training um, uh, where in 14 different states were represented there. So I'm going to call this the national sample. And we just had them do the task. Um, in this task, um, in this version of this, the task, we gave them almost a second to make their, their responses. So we're putting them under some time pressure. But as you'll see, it turns out to be not, not very much time pressure for these, these folks. Um, what we can see um, is, uh, is a, so here are the response times. Um, and what we can see is that for each of these samples, the, you don't need to process all 12 of those bars. For each of these samples, we are seeing a pattern of racial bias. Everyone is faster when targets are stereotype consistent. The black armed targets, they shoot them quickly. The white unarmed targets, they say don't shoot quickly. Everybody does this. The, the national officers, the Denver officers, and the Denver community, all statistically equivalent. Um, uh, no real differences between these three groups of, of, of participants. The stunning thing, and this really caught us off guard, we were not, I was not predicting this, is what happens when we look at bias in the decisions to shoot. So here again, we're looking at mistakes that people make. And again, a low bar says, um, I'm, I'm willing to shoot. And what we can see is that for the Denver community, they have a very low bar for black targets. They, they are willing to shoot these targets, so kind of a trigger happy orientation, much more conservative orientation to the white targets. What we can see for the officers is both that they are more conservative in general. Um, they are less willing to shoot, but they are particularly less willing to shoot for the black targets. Um, so in neither uh, the national sample or the Denver sample of police officers, did we see statistically significant evidence of bias in the decision to shoot. Now, the trend here with the Denver officers is, I mean, it's leaning in that direction, but it's not significant. So we just didn't believe this, honestly. Um, so we went back and we made the, we made the task harder. Um, so in this version of the task, uh, we forced them to go, it's the same basic deal, a much smaller sample, but 30 officers from Denver, 30 civilians from Denver, and we gave them a much shorter period of time to respond. So 630 milliseconds, it's just over half a second. Um, even when I do the task, this is hard. Um, and here's what we found. Um, in terms of bias, um, the, this this is a chart of sensitivity, and basically what you can, this is again how good this is how good people are at, at the task, and what we can see is that officers across in all of these studies, the officers massively outperform the rest of us. Um, they're better at the task um, than the community members, but we also critically see a reduction in bias. So the Denver community is again setting a lower bar to shoot black targets. 
higher bar to shoot white targets. And for the officers, there's no statistical difference between those two bars. So um, this is, this was a surprise. This was a surprise to us. And we honestly did not know how to make sense of it. Um, we do not believe that officers are somehow immune from stereotypes in the real world, um, uh, even now. Um, but uh, clearly their performance here, um, at least on the, the, the patterns of mistakes that they're making, seems relatively unbiased. Con con contrast that though with how they perform with, with the data that I showed you a while ago on, on the reaction times, where all through the Denver officers, the national officers, the Denver community, everybody was showing bias um, in terms of how quickly they can respond. And what this really sets up is, is an idea that everybody is active, is thinking in stereotypic terms, the, the officers too. When they see a black target, the idea of danger comes to mind. But the officers, unlike the rest of us, are somehow able to control the degree to which that impacts the decision that they ultimately make. So even if the idea of danger comes to mind, they seem to not use it when deciding whether or not to shoot. Stunning. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of that. Um, but before I do, I just wanna just also point out, this seems to be a training-based effect. Um, so in a very silly study, we just had participants um, perform the task a couple of times in a row. And what we found, um, so I'm going to talk about reducing bias through training, and then I'm going to talk about really the mechanism that we think is going on here. Um, so let's look at just, again, this is a silly study. We bring participants into the laboratory, we have them do the, the, the task, the video game task, and then we have them do it again. So the, fir <laughs> the first round of tasks of the task is like our training. That's their experience with it. The crazy thing is, um, when we look at their behavior, um, I'm going to present their behavior both in terms of reaction times and again the, the mistakes that they make in terms of that, that low bar, low bar versus high bar thing. Um, when we look at their reaction times, they're showing bias um, both in the first round and in the second round of performance. So bias, like the, the presence of stereotypes, is not going away by virtue of, of our our training, our training manipulation here. But participants are learning to control their behavior. So even though they seem to be thinking about stereotypes, um, um, and, and you know, when they first do the task, those stereotypes are impacting their performance. Here they set a lower bar for black targets and a higher bar for white targets, same as every other chart I've shown you from non-police officers. Um, when we switch to the second round of the task, they show no bias. They are not shooting black targets more frequently than white targets. As if even though the stereotypes are coming to mind, they're not using them when making their decisions. Um, again, it's just, it was hard for us to process this, hard for us to really believe it. So we were gonna try to, we wanted to test this idea. And this is one of my favorite studies. Um, but here we, um, here we have that little uh, model I presented with you. But the idea is, right, like even if I notice that a target is black, even if I think about the idea of dangerous, if I can exert control at this critical point I can exert cognitive control, I can potentially shift my behavior, even though the stereotypes are active. So the way we wanted to test this, or one of the ways we tested this, is by going back to that study that I told you about before, where um, we have people read about these nasty, nasty, violent crimes, either committed by a white suspect or by a black suspect. And then we have them perform the test. But the critical thing is, some of the people that we have do this are police officers, and some of them are just you and me. Um, and so, so we have novices and we have police officers. And in a, um, I'm simplifying the chart here a little bit. So um, the, the y-axis on this chart here, now just the, the higher the bar is, the more bias we're, we're seeing, um, um, the more anti-black bias we're seeing. And what we can see is that when novices read about a white criminal, they show no bias. They're, they're right around fair. Again, they're not, they don't stop shooting the black targets, but now they're shooting the white targets too. So, um, so they're unbiased. Um, but when they read about the black criminal, um, then their bias goes through the roof. The stunning thing is that with police officers, this manipulation has no effect. Two important points. One, their bias, their overall level of bias is really close to zero. It's not significant, it's not significant um, no matter who they read about. And two, the second important point, their bias doesn't go up 
in any meaningful way when they read about a black suspect rather than a white suspect. Again, we think they are thinking about in stereotypic terms, but they are able to control their behavior in a way um, that you and I, most people, are not. Um, okay. <clears throat> So that sounds great, right? Um, police officers are showing less bias. Um, we can train people and they, you know, they magically show this reduction in bias. They might still be thinking in stereotypic terms, but stereotypes are no longer impacting the real world behavior that we care about. That sounds lovely. What could possibly go wrong? Well, a couple of things. Um, one is the inability to implement control. Um, and the second is a failure to learn control in the first place. Um, these are both pretty devastating critiques, actually. Um, the first one is more, more widespread. Um, so I want to talk about it first. Um, let's just consider um, for a minute the situation that these police officers are in when they're performing this task. They're sitting in a safe little cubicle, maybe in their, in their station, uh, in the roll call room, um, at a laptop. They're pushing buttons on a computer. Uh, they're watching pictures on a screen. Um, they are reasonably confident that they are going to survive the situation that we put them in. There's no threat there. Um, there's time pressure, um, and maybe it's a little bit confusing, but compared to what they face on the street when they're like in a traffic stop or when they're viewing that, that, that silhouette in the alley, like this is not a threat. This is not a threat. Um, this is a situation that feels fairly comfortable, and it's a great place for them to exert mental control, cognitive control over their behavior. Um, that is not the real world. Um, and we can't study the real world. We cannot put, we cannot ethically put anyone, police officers or anybody else, in a situation where they're afraid for their lives. But that's what we want to try to understand. Um, in this study, we are going to, we're not going to deal with real police officers. We're going to train undergraduates to um, be experts at the task. We give them several hundred trials of training, um, or we don't. So we have no, a novice group that is new to the task, and we have a, a trained group, that, an expert group, um, that has a lot of experience with the task. And again, that tends to push performance to, some, to the kinds of patterns that we see with police officers. Um, but then the, the trick of this study was um, that we're going to manipulate whether this is an easy task cognitively or whether it's a challenging task. Again, we can't put people in a situation where they're scared for their lives, but we can deplete their cognitive resources in the same way that fear or fatigue um, or stress would tend to deplete your cognitive resources. Um, so we had them do the same silly video game, um, but as they were playing, there were words that they were listening to in their headphones. Um, it would say three, eight, six. Um, and as they're doing this, they're, they're, they approach this in one of three different conditions. Um, in one condition, the, the players are just told, don't worry about this, the words that you hear. You don't have to do anything with them. Um, just ignore them. <clears throat> in a second condition, we ask them to actually process that information. So we're taking away some of their cognitive resources. We say, for each word that you hear, you have to compare it to the number five. Is it higher or lower than the number five? So three, that's below five. Eight, that's above five. Six, that's above five. Now, again, fairly simple cognitive operation, but it requires some, it's a secondary task that these, these folks have to do. And then in the third condition, um, we ask them to compare whichever word they just heard to the word that they heard last time. So, um, so after I hear the word three, when I hear the word eight, I have to say is eight more or less than three? This is called an end back task. And it's used by cognitive psychologists to deplete cognitive research to, as a, um, a load that is cognitively demanding. So I have to be thinking, I have to remember the, 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 I have to remember the word, the number three, I have to listen for the word eight, I have to compare them, then I have to store the word eight and get ready to listen to the word six, and then I have to compare them. So it's a more taxing um, thing. Again, nothing compared to what um, people experience on the street. Um, so I'm just going to skip this. What did we see in terms of the, the pattern of bias? Uh, for the novices, oh, so with, when there is no cognitive load, we see the basic pattern that we expect to see with novices versus experts. Novices show pretty pro profound levels of bias. 
Um, um, again, I'm just graphing here, I'm graphing the total level of bias, so higher numbers mean more biased on this one. Um, um, so the novices are showing pretty profound levels of bias and the experts are showing none at all. And then we look at what happens when we increase load, when we make the, the task more difficult. Um, strangely, the novices actually seem to show a reduction in bias, but we think this is just because the task gets so much more difficult that they're, they're floundering around um, and not s responding in any systematic pattern. Watch what happens with the experts though. As we deplete their resources, bias goes from non-existent to marginally significant to statistically significant. So bias is just ramping up as we take away the resources that they have. Why is that important? Well, again, when police officers are on the street, they are often fatigued. They are, these folks work crazy hours. Um, they're often, they're up in the middle of the night when the rest of us are asleep. Um, and for many of us, our brains are not functioning particularly effectively um, in, in, at 2 a.m., even if, even if we're always up at 2 a.m. Um, and then uh, they're scared, they are confused, uh, they might be having to listen to their radio at the same time that they're trying to uh, judge a situation. Um, it's a tricky job. Um, and in that trickiness lies the problem. Um, because if I'm not in a safe, secure, simple location, um, I don't have the resources that I need to control the expression of bias. Um, the last thing I want to discuss is the idea that some of these officers may not ever learn to exert control. Um, and the, the way we looked at this is by looking at special, um, special units, gang units. Um, gang units are controversial for a, a lot of reasons. Um, one of the things, uh, this is a quote from um, Chicago. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems is that um, these officers are usually pretty, depending on your perspective, aggressive or assertive. Um, they don't, it's not kind of like, let's assess the situation and decide what to do. No, they go in and they take people down, put them in zip tie handcuffs and um, bring them in. Um, they're very, very um, effective, um, but they're also extremely aggressive. Uh, and that doesn't breed the kind of cognitive control that we're talking about here. If my approach to this thing is just to go in hard, um, I'm not going to learn, um, I'm not going to learn to exert the kind of cognitive control that I need to do. Um, so, so here we're just testing um, community members, regular cops. Um, these are actually the data that I showed you before. Um, beat cops show a massive reduction in bias relative to the community. Let's look at the special unit cops. These folks are, they're a little, they're more conservative in general, but for them, the black bar is statistically significant, like well below the white bar. They are showing as much bias as the, as the untrained community members, as if by virtue of being in a special unit, being in a gang unit, um, they are not learning to exert the kind of control that we expect from the officers, even, even in a safe situation. So this, is a, this study was done in a totally safe, you know, right, again, just sitting at a laptop pushing buttons. Um, there's no threat here. So even in that kind of controlled situation, the special unit cops can't not show bias. Um, okay, so the conclusions that I'd like to kind of highlight from this are um, that practice, training in a, of a particular kind can attenuate bias. Um, we don't think we're changing people's attitudes. Um, but we think we're, we're helping them build up the capacity for control. Um, that's great, um, except that in the real world under non-optimal condi conditions, stress, fatigue, cognitive load, um, and like, like literally fearing for your life, fear, <laughs> in a situation where you're fearing for your life, that is not good for cognitive control. That's not good for, you can't do higher order math when you're scared for your life. Um, our brains don't work like that. We, we revert back to something a little bit more primal. And um, so we think that, that even though police officers look much better in, in, our, in the, the laboratory tests, that it's not indicative of what's gonna happen in the real world, of what does happen in the real world. Um, there is an interesting aspect to this though, which is that if we train police officers, rather than at a firing range, or with a video simulator, if we train them in a highly engaging, fear-inducing, high-stress environment, and um, then we may help them, we may train them to deal with the actual challenges 
um, that they are going to experience on the street. Um, this is a well-known psychological principle. If you are if you need to be, if you're if you're getting ready for a test, uh, you're getting ready for a multiple, you're getting ready for a multiple choice test um, that's going to be administered on the computer. Then the way that you practice for it is to do a multiple choice test administered on a computer. You you do the same thing at the training that you're going to do at test because that's the way we learn to do it well. Um, so perhaps we should be training police officers in the same kinds of situations that where we want them to be making unbiased decisions. The last thing that I want to talk about, um, and this will come back to the, the question that was raised earlier, um, is an idea that has been um, not just tossed around, but like, sw like swallowed wholeheartedly by law enforcement uh, at the federal level, at every state level, um, millions and millions, million, like I don't know how many millions of dollars have been spent on anti anti-bias type training. Um, despite the fact that social psychologists have shown and like well aware for at least the past four or five years that this does not work. Um, we can't scrub out the nugget of bias in our heads and then release these people back into the real world, um, a real world where race is correlated with poverty, deficits in education, uh, crime. Like the, if, we're, if we go back out into that real world, we're going to relearn those lessons. Um, um, so we can't, we can't, we can't do that. It doesn't, it, this, isn't a, this isn't a thing. Um, uh, a, a stunning study back in 2016 showed that none, not one of the interventions that psychologists have developed um, uh, effectively reduces bias for more than a couple minutes. We can reduce it for a couple minutes. Um, I can have you read that story about the white, white criminals and I can get you to show no, I can get you to perform the, my little task and not show any bias. But that's a, like a tiny little intervention. Um, is it any surprise that if I, I sit you down for a half hour or a day or even a week um, that I can't overwrite years, decades of experience in the world? Um, no, that's not a surprise at all. It should not be a, it should not be a shock to us. Um, there was a recent study of the NYPD where they administered, they have mandatory anti, like implicit bias awareness training, which is designed not just to reduce bias, but is to kind of make people aware of the problem. And that's, that's a good thing to be aware of, I think. Um, um, but it showed no change in the officer's behavior on the street. Um, it's just not, it just doesn't, it's not a thing. Um, and this comes back to the point about the, the black participants playing this game. Um, we all live in a world, um, within the United States at least, we all live in a world where bias is, is a cultural thing. It is, in, it is, it is um, built in to our systems um, of education, of employment, of uh, law enforcement, right? Like it is, it's there. Um, your brain is designed to help you navigate the world that is there. Not the world that you want to navigate, but the world that is there. So like you might like every sidewalk to be perfectly smooth, but if there are cracks and jet, like you need to be aware of that. You can't say, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make uh, predictions about how to step based on, on the real world. I'm going to make predictions based on an ideal plane in, you know, like some platonic, like that's not a thing. Like your brain is designed to make, to help you walk down the street. And in our, our, in our country, that street is, is defined by racial bias in many ways. So um, it's not a question of the bias. It, it is a question of the bias in our own minds but it's also a question of the bias that exists all around us, um, which our minds simply reflect. Uh, and that is a tough lesson. Um, and it really, it confuses me about then, you know, okay, so what do we do? Um, I have some ideas, but there's not, <laughs> it's a tricky thing, right? Like, I think the real solution is make the world less biased and then our brains will be less reflective of that bias. Joshua? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ted Howard um, talking. Um, seems I'm wondering whether 
there is a certain culture in police departments that people get caught up with sure. uh, that tend to dominate in, in times of stress. And there's then they also, when you're out there on the streets and you're confronted with danger, isn't it true that your adrenaline rises and there's all sorts of physiological changes in you which uh, impair your judgment, which interfere sure. with judgment? Yeah, unless, so, unless you're trained for it, right? Like, unless so, you're trained for it. But I mean, even then it's going to have some detrimental impact, but absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's the whole process that kind of overrides your kind of your prefrontal cortex where you're like, Oh no, I want to, I want to behave in an unbiased fashion. Like, no, no, I want to get out of here alive. Like, um, I'm scared. I'm like terrified. Um, yeah, it, the, the culture in the police departments, that, that's a thing too, right? They, they're, um, there was a, uh, kind of landmark, um, paper written, I guess like 15 years ago now um, about, you know, what we know about when police officers use deadly force. Um, it's literally called deadly force. What do we know? Um, and one of the things they talk about are differences um, in police culture uh, as a function of like leadership, um, having, having um, high level positions filled by um, minorities is, is that ends up being kind of um, helpful, but you know, there's, um, even within that, there are, um, yeah, so I don't want to under, I don't want to downplay the role of that, but I think even in well, the, the nasty thing about this is you could be, you could be in a fairly, um, egalitarian, um, culture in a police department. You could, you could be a, um, a, a, an officer who really wants to do the right thing. And, you know, I've interacted with hundreds of these folks now, my strong sense is that most, not all of them, some of them, like I would not want them to stop me. Um, I would be scared. They seem like bullies. Um, but a lot of them seem like good people trying to do a hard job. And, um, you know, the, the point of this is it's not the bad app. This isn't a, the bad, it's not a bad apple problem. Um, even the people who are, are who want to do right um, are going to be struggling with these kinds of problems. Um, you have somebody who wants to do right and who comes from a, 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 a department with a good kind of healthy culture. Um, but we live in a world, like we, everybody knows these stereotypes about black people. Like we all know, um, again, we may consciously disagree with them, but we all, our brains are aware of them and your brain's job is to predict. Um, so it's going to use any tool it can find. Joshua, I just want to let you know and let the group know I'm going to stop the